the IndyCar is overwhelming. It's probably the most insane thing I've ever done. But honestly, isn't every car project that way? I mean, the four-wheeler was overwhelming. Hell, you could take an F1 engineer, show them your stock Civic that has a really rough idle, and they'd be scratching their head. There's something to it, this whole process. And I'll break down what it takes that all the experts that I know of don't even recognize that they're doing, and it's what separates them from beginners. The simplest answer to this entire video is to look at just this. Just one thing. Don't look at all of this. All this, all the panels. All, it, it's overwhelming. You know what I see when I look at it this way? I see I need a master brake cylinder. I see I don't even have brake pads or rotors. I see I don't have wheel speed sensors, a steering wheel, steering wheel wiring. The list goes on and on. But what you do when it comes to properly working on a car and not wasting your own time, which is really, or effort or energy or any of that, is to focus on very small things. It all starts with something like this. If you've seen my wiring videos, you know that this is the heart of the car. This, on this motor, is the crank angle sensor. So it tells you where the engine is in position. Every 360 degrees, it can tell that, hey, there's pulse, 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 space, pulse, pulse, and so on. Every motor has this. Without this, you can't do a test fire, you can't get the car idling, you can't get the car driving, you can't practice on the track, you can't race, and you certainly can't win, and most importantly, you can't make clout chasing videos on YouTube. This is very, very important. Focus on the most specific thing, the most critical thing, and then if you're looking for that little bit of a dopamine brush, try and look for something that's familiar to you. Now, this is a good example because even in my position, there's nothing on this motor I've ever used. How would I take it on the next step? Well, work backwards from air, fuel, spark. So what I did from here, looked at this box, which actually, even simpler, starts down here. Now, if you see this panel, I was looking for sparks, right? And sure enough, there are the coils. They go on the plugs, top, coil and plugs. And then this is the thing that goes to those. Here, I started working backwards. I was like, okay, there are six pins on this. For sure, four of those pins are to fire each one of those coils. And that, sure enough, checked out. And then the other two, I guessed, were power. That also checked out. And then I looked, oh, it plugs into this box up here. You've got the same thing on the other side. Oddly enough, they're different sizes. But the wiring checked out. So we know that the spark system goes like that. Here's what threw me off. Some of you guys may have seen me on Instagram posting this on my stories. This is the input for this little box. So all of my ignition somehow is on one, two, three, four, five, six wires. So again, forget the whole car. I have a six wire problem that nothing else matters. Sure enough, I cracked the box open and found that two wires were fused together. Two more wires were fused together. So I figured that's power and ground. And uh, sure enough, I was right on that one. And then at least only two wires to fire eight spark plugs. Well, I hit another roadblock. The natural human thing is to go, okay, well, uh, let me look at what's over here. And I did that a little bit, but that gets you nowhere. You need to build off of the base. And so what I did was research what ignition system could only run two wires. In your mind, if you think of it in binary, both off, one on, other one on, both on, that's four possible scenarios. I'm like, that's, it's not that, that's, that's not gonna work. Even with wasted spark and all that, that just doesn't make sense. So I thought about it further and I'm like, it's pulsing. It's got to be like a can signal or it's pulsing back and forth and it somehow knows if I pulse on this one, it means this coil and then pulse on that one, it means that coil back and forth. I'm like, no way. Sure enough, there is a ignition system called a twin distribution ignition system. And that's exactly what this uses. Think of like old school distributor caps, you know, where it has a little thing in the center. And if you ever take them apart, right, to clean those little contacts, tink, 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 tink. That goes in a very consistent pattern, right? both sides, it goes back and forth and fires left and right, left and right. And so there's no magic can bus, thankfully. It's just simply on off on two different things. And the crazy part of all that, Haltech already has that. And I mapped all these out. If I had six wires, I could power this whole system. And by the way, this system with only two power and two ground wires only takes a total at 14,500 RPM, it only takes 10 amps to run. The one thing working to the advantage of a piston engine is that it takes two full cycles, takes 720 degrees to have a full complete process. Rotary engines only have 360 degrees. I think one of their advantages, but the other disadvantage to rotary is two sparks at almost the exact same time leading and trailing. So when you have a CDI system for a rotary, you have to have two because the capacitor can't recharge that quick. It can charge enough between rotors or cylinders in this case and that's why you can use a 10 amp one. Let's build off of that. These are sensors. I understand that because the sensors 
all have names here. If you look at the back side of the sensor, six pins again. Six pins for what? So I was like, okay, these are pressure and temperature because you only need three wires for all pressure sensors I've seen and you only need two wires for temp. So I was like, okay, five minus one. I traced out the wires and that means all six of these must go to somewhere on here. Nope, the first four do. The other two aren't connected to anything. So then that started making me think, wait, that's a water sensor? What's this one? That is clearly a temp sensor. You take it off, it's just a temp sensor. Now it's got five pins. I'm like, oh my God, I cannot figure out what the hell's going on. But you start connecting all these in, and sure enough, that is a temperature sensor, this is a pressure sensor. The only scary thing for me at this point is, which wire's which? This was the next thing I did until about five in the morning last night. These little carbon things are a beautiful way of hiding the craziness of the wiring. And what looks like this actually looks... Whoa. Yeah, Joel hasn't even seen this yet. Last night I went through and mapped all of this out, and thankfully, some of these things had extra stickers on them. I did not know there was an aux throttle position sensor. Obviously, throttle position sensor. Thankfully, somebody put this here, cam, crank, and TPS. Those are arguably the most important three. So then I had this one, which says POV. No idea what that one is. As you can tell, everything comes into this connector and goes through everything else. That seems cool, but then you go to the other side and it's just as insane, if not slightly more. Beauty and the beast. So this has a couple weird things. M MOT, MOT power, no idea what that is, right? But then this confirms what I was thinking. Ignition goes all the way to the front right here. This is that MOT power. And oddly enough, this one right here, look at this, it doesn't actually connect to anything else. So that's just an extension cable as far as I'm concerned. On both sides, there's this connector. And those both go down under this manifold. Long story short, that's the 16 uh, injectors two for each cylinder. Running methanol is a pain in the ass. I mapped all of that out and found wires that were in common and it just started making things less scary. Now, the goal is you basically start writing down all your unknowns or uncertainties and then just hammer through them. Unfortunately, this motor has no YouTube videos, no old forum posts, no pictures because this was a competitive race motor and not even the teams that raced with this motor were allowed to work on it. So if anything, I'm a very fortunate person because I'm basically like the level of a Cosworth employee back in the late 90s, early 2000s. If this guy is the most important thing on this engine, this is a wild little sensor too. This is something new to me. This is a cam angle sensor. And what this actually does is really simple. It goes down right in here. It's a moon, but only half of it. So all it's doing is on a piston engine, this is for all you rotary guys here, this might be common knowledge to everybody else, but not to me, because I'm treating this very diagnostically, is that every rotation of the motor is only half of the combustion process. You know, it's a four cycle engine. And so this tells you which of those two four cycles you're in. So it's like the first 360 or the second 360. And so then you know which one of those, which one of the four phases basically is currently going on based on the bottom one and the top one. You can actually, and Cosworth did this. All, the only information I could find is that a lot of their motors didn't have this. You can still run the motor with just one of these. You just have to guess. So am I on the first 360 or the second 360? Uh, let's pick one. And then does the motor fire up? And if it doesn't, switch it to the other one. This monstrous, weird-ass motor becomes less crazy. I now know how this engine works you can kick yourself in the dick real quickly. So this connector was the Mott connector. There's a ninth throttle body. Now, mind you, inside there, each one of those throttle blades, it's ITBs, are all connected to this throttle position sensor. Simple, three wire. But then there's this power that can control basically, I think, a rudimentary electric throttle body. So the other one right here, this little guy, ends up being the sensor for that aux throttle position sensor. Why do I have two throttle body sets? Well, that was because old turbos didn't spool as well. So it's basically trying to close off the air and then force it back in. Even if we want to do that now, that gets kind of weird. And that's because of this connector right here. This connector is called PCI. I don't remember what PCI stands for, but I know what PCI is. PCI is four injectors. They're all right in this area and they sit in the front of the turbo and give up to 20, maybe even 30% of the total fuel for the engine into the front of the turbo. So it's pre-turbo fuel injection. That's what makes some of my ideas for this a little scary because you can't run a blow off valve with that. Because imagine a blow off valve with fuel in the entire air fuel mixture is already happening way up here. So say you're at full boost, this thing's making 900 horsepower, 
you got all this fuel and air cooling down the intake temps, and then you do a blow off valve. The blow off valve is going to shoot methanol straight out into the engine bay, which the turbo's right here. All these exhaust manifolds and wastegates and everything are all here. No matter how much you have coated or anything like that, you're asking for a really cool party that I do not ever want to experience. This thing can't have a blow off valve. Like, these are the sort of things you just keep going further and further. Now, in a video maybe six months ago, we figured out the mechanical side of this, that this is actually a fuel pressure regulator. Sure enough, there's a hole that connects this fuel sensor to this area here. That's double O-ringed, and so you can see all this craziness. So the fuel pressure regulator is actually built into the top dome with a mechanical fuel pump. That's probably the most efficient way you can go. TurboSmart and all those other companies now have made some really impressive, more compact, high-flowing fuel pressure regulators, but this is fuel in, fuel out. Simple enough. The only thing I currently have a problem with is this wire right here. But this connector goes all the way down to right here. That is my entire alternator. Fuel, air, spark, so far so good. I've got all the fuel injectors mapped out. Everything needs to have electrical power. And that alternator scares me for two reasons. One is that I don't think it has any like the controls on it. Most alternators have their self-regulating. I think this is very, very compact. With how small it is, I'm afraid of how many or how few amps it'll generate. So I'm just gonna give you a number. I'm gonna say 70 amps. I'm gonna say that that's probably what that thing can do. This car does not have fans. This car does not have electric fuel pumps. It's a mechanical fuel pump. So no fans on the radiators. It's kind of a famous video of a, an F1 car sitting at Goodwood waiting in that turnaround. And because he's sitting there, F1, IndyCar, same thing. They don't have fans, so the damn car overheats and catches on fire. You can't idle these cars like that. I will, but you can't. <laughs> the need for electricity is very minimalized because the majority of the big ticket items aren't there. I'm concerned, and I'm gonna have to disassemble this. There's four thick, whatever, 16 gauge pins, and then there's eight 20 gauge pins. I'm gonna guess some of those outer ones are control, maybe it's extra power lines, but you're talking four 16 gauge, 16 gauge can probably do what, 12 amps? You can see that everything kind of gets broken down more and more, and so as soon as I turn around, as soon as I go like this, I'm like, ah, nope. <laughs> All of that, nope. And you wanna see the easiest way to overwhelm yourself? This is chaos, these are old connectors, you can't even buy them anymore. They were like the predecessor to the auto sports. And I think somebody must have cut a, a connector off at some point, that's an auto sport connector. That's what you see on the four rotor. That's very familiar. It must have been updated, modernized. And actually, I do know that this Pi thing, I've seen on Cosworth's website, that was like an old logging system, so I'm sure they updated that. This is chaos. I don't even have any of the devices that half plugs into, but this is what I did. Simply took all their naming schemas and T-joints and all that sort of stuff and just documented this harness because I'm going to start cutting it up. Regulate power, regulate alternator. That's what scares me about the alternator. We can make something that does that. <laughs> I think actually even the Haltech has some level of uh, alternator control. You can just see a lot of things that I don't have. As I looked at this section right here, RH injector, LH injector, alternator. Really, you're, you're left with these three. So I think I'm going to cut these off ultimately and reuse the connectors and then buy the pins for this because I'm pretty sure you can get these pins fairly easily. And they're all... 16, 20, maybe even 22 gauge. I have everything up to this spot mapped out, so check this out. This is too overwhelming, right? So we'll back up. These are the things I showed you earlier. The left-hand side under the carbon. There's the mot pass-through, and then there's all the connectors there. And then I went and literally pinned out everything. This is the injector harness. It has 22 pins, only uses 12 of them. Top left-hand side. So pins one through eight are actually the injector harness. And then nine, 10, 11, 12 are all power for that. You start seeing, okay, there's the fuel. There's three fuel lines, you know, so it's fuel pressure. Then there's oil pressure. All the ignition is basically the rest of it. So that, right there, that simplified that I know what is coming to this point. And again, we're building off of stuff. It makes this harness become a little bit easier to understand. So then let's go to the harder one. So this is the right-hand side of the motor. And you can see it's a lot more complex. It's got the crank, the cam, throttle position, PCI, temperatures. It barely fit on the sheet. Again, injectors. First eight, this one's the one we're looking at now, much more complex, 55 pins versus 37, I think? Yeah, 55, 37. So 55, I started noticing some trends here, but I found the boost, pressure, crank, cam, throttle, so on. I started looking for things that might be common. So all of these eventually have to go through down to here. And these are the big ones that sadly are wasted. 
These say ECU connector two and three, and then there's this one that's ECU connector one. These are 79 pins. And then these are all 16 or 20 gauge, I don't remember. That is the end all be all. Now I don't have this ECU, I will not get this ECU. It's gonna be way too expensive and it runs on Windows 95 or some random shit. Not even worth trying to do that, other than maybe if I had the pin out for the ECU, that would be cool. Then we start looking at the rest of the stuff and you start realizing that we found our limit. This is all the Pi, P1, PI, MUX connector. That's all logging. This whole section here, is battery, they're all bigger pins, so that does make sense. That looks similar to the alternator one. If I get lost right now, if I get flustered and overwhelmed, I haven't lost the foundation. If you start here, you're gonna get overwhelmed, and that's really like the diagnostic process to all this is it's not magic. Nobody thinks about it when, they're, when they get good at something, they just think that they're, they got more to diagnose. Now that I've got the lengths of this and all that, this, is going goodbye. I thought we could maybe cut these off and reuse it, but now we have tons of connectors that go to nothing that could short out the car. Let me show you what we're replacing all of this with. I wanna start this little section off by saying if you work at Hoonigan and you're missing one of these jackets from SEMA, too damn bad. I, <laughs> Zach, Zach <laughs> That's gave too it, damn bad. That's too damn bad. <laughs> Zach gave it to me to keep me warm because he cares about my well-being. And uh, I, I think he stole one of his coworkers. <laughs> it is very warm and nice. Not a merch promotion or anything like that, but down to business. I've had this box before SEMA rush started. And what we are about to do is embark on this. We are ready. Our bodies are willing, able, and, and moist for Cosworth. <laughs> And IndyCar. We've grown. You forgot your name. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's a, good, that's a good one. Yeah, so this is kind of emotionally what the four-roader always was supposed to start as, is an engine build and then a chassis build. So the best part to me about a wild engine is having a wild computer, a second layer of the box to the computer. Whoa, 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 whoa. you didn't see the warning, did Performance-enhancing technology. Oh, there's Viagra in here. Welcome to the Haltech family, dude. No, hell yeah. We got I like unboxing. I see, I just saw breast somewhere in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, breast. <laughs> that was, that was where I felt. <laughs> we need to get out more. That, Do you have a different finish from the other one? I think so. We had such an early production version. And I think the, the electronics are identical. But this wow. is the Nexus R5. For those of you not familiar, the R5 is... I think they even say VMU. The point is, is that it's both a massive computer and a lot of power management. And on the four rotor, we had even more power management, so we needed an extra power unit. But this has 100 amps, 120 concurrent amps, but you have four 25 amp circuits and 12 eight amp circuits. And you can see all of those blinking right there when you've done something wrong and shorted it out. But the IndyCar, crazy enough, we are limited on alternator if we're gonna stick with the stock alternator. So that means we're limited to the amount of power here because that alternator guaranteed does not kick out 200 amps. That means that everything can run through just one computer. Just those of you not familiar with this, if you're looking at the market, I know Nexus R3 just came out. That is of course like a mild version of this. I can't recommend this ECU enough. It took everything that Adaptronic was trying to do and polished it with all of Holotech's insanity. This is about $4,000, a little bit of over $4,000, and it is worth every bit of that. I normally am not the guy to, to want the more expensive things. When you have an entire damn four-rotor all-wheel drive system, every part of that car is running through one computer. That's this one right here. So I know that it'll run the Indy car famously well. What does this mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's my secret. <laughs> How does this relate to, to this? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't at all. Man. I think I'm actually gonna ask Kev to help us rewire this I was this just gonna thing. say, if you come, I'll have your aguardente ready, but you, I'm gonna just give you like a shot every three hours. Yeah, yeah, we, we got ration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this because it flips it upside down if you want the ECU to be facing like this. Oh, wow. Which we had that issue. And so we could actually, see, look at that. Whoop. Smart. Yeah, wow. that, is, that is really smart. Oh, wow. They got us a TV. That is bigger than i thought it was this is like the size of old school plasma screen tvs <laughs> where are we gonna fit this in there uh behind the uh i don't know that yeah <laughs> uh, no behind the steering wheel I wow think. this is really cool they give you a mounting template in the book most everybody has that but we'll let them go <laughs> so you've been letting me struggle this whole time <laughs> yeah you wouldn't know how to read it anyway this will sink in further and that actually 
Might work. Might work really well. This is eight EGT sensors, and it is actually mind blowing to, to see, but we have all eight for each cylinder on this car. Now, I guess we'll actually install knock sensors, but yeah, you actually, well, I wonder what you're gonna do with knock sensors. I, I'm gonna look at the data, <laughs> like, okay, that's that's knock. <laughs> I don't know what it does, but it's knocking. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer. So that's why I wear this shirt with pride. Now, this is where we're at now, right? We've got a chassis, we've got a lot of really cool, crazy carbon pieces, flat bottom that is gonna inspire the updated version of the four rotor, because look, look at that insane. Here's my problem right now. We have all this. It's an absolute mess. Now, I can work in a very messy environment, but it's distractingly messy. And so we're going to go ahead and hose it off in efforts to simplify the car more and more. We are just taking all the superfluous stuff off the seatbelts, everything that is going to be replaced either way, including this, just so that way we can hose this whole thing down. This is the thing that kind of holds your shoulders under. And of course, it's your headrest. It's cool. Look at this. You can see the Lola cars. It's a T9700, and then they were using the middle seatbelt height, but you can set the height of the seatbelt. That's really impressive. Not to mention you took that nasty ass seat out. Yeah, we're gonna make our own. It's one of those like build your own adventures for your own seats. I'm curious what's behind that butt panel. This is actually a six pointer. It's something that it's got two submarine belts. Whoa. It's on one side and on the other side. Nice. Oh, what do we got? What's that wire? That's, yeah. that's new. Oh, it's like a brake line or something. <laughs> no. uh, I didn't even think about all those. We have to run to the car. I've been wondering what this is for a while. It does, there we go. There we are. Even more car. It's the top of the gas tank right there. This car has gone through multiple like phases of things that like are now hidden. That's why whenever you look at the five pictures on here, nothing's the same because like oh, in one year or one race, they implemented this thing, whatever that is. It's crazy how weird that is. Like there's this, that's a gas inlet. And then there's one over here too. And I'm assuming that this circle is the same as this circle, which means that that means that there's a third gas tank. I don't know. Yeah, this is so rudimentary, this thing. Went and figured out the adapters for all this. That is an air jack system. That's so cool. Now that is 150, 140 PSI, not high enough pressure to pick this car up with an engine in it, but still. Yeah, you can see. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> needs more pressure. Yeah, it needs more pressure. They could even track. While we were cleaning out the seat, we realized that there are these canisters and they're all blue and red lines, which I knew that was a pressure line. And so we decided to put pressure to them. And sure enough, those are the two front air jacks still working. But you need like 300, 400 PSI to really bring the car up. Two in the front, one in the very rear of the car. That's actually pretty cool. We don't need more air pressure, but I wish we had it more air pressure to make the system work properly. I'm not actually asleep. That we just were uh, screwing around before calling it a quits for the night, and with all that stuff out, I sit way too low, but it's a lot more uh, not claustrophobic. claustrophobic. Thank you. My shoulders don't feel nearly as scared. <laughs> My shoulders are scared, and I feel like the steering wheel has mo way more room, so I think I think the, the car's going to be even crazier. Dude, that's an insane view of... Would it be like driving? This thing? Dude, your eye line is the top of the tire, no matter what you do. Wow. That is a very weird, like all those video games get that right. It looks like you're just driving a set of wheels. That's, it, 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 it's so weird. The wood shifter cracks me up. Oh, I didn't notice when you shift, this thing moves right Yeah, here. so that's, that's the shift shift. That's the actual shifter. Then the bottom one, um, if anybody knows what this is, there's a red handle. So there's the red handle, and then there's the actual shifter shifter. I don't know what this red handle does, but show them where it goes all the way to back. Yeah, that's the red handle. Joel's best theory right now is that it's reverse, and I, I, can't, I can't argue that that's... Because I have a clutch pedal. It's not a clutch. You know, like a hand clutch for like a bike. It's not that. E-brake, but it's, it's meant to be grabbed with one finger. I've never seen one of these things reverse. Have yeah, you? I wouldn't see a reason to, and that would be just in, like a bike. Well, a bike doesn't reverse. But yeah, so we're going to have to invent linkage from that thing 
to the transmission as well. I very much am aware that that little hole right there is technically exposed to the inside of the gas tank, but God knows what's in the gas tank to begin with. I wouldn't trust it anyway. It's unfortunate the dirt's kind of mixing a little bit more, but we'll, we'll clean that out, that access panel, when we go to do the real thing. We'll do it right. Well, that uh, certainly changes it considerably. Like that whole bottom tray looks so much more aesthetically pleasing that your eyes aren't going crazy looking at everything. But I think you guys agree with me. I think that's what we do next. It's time to get that motor into the car. 